Thank you for that awesome information, Mr. Hope. <clears throat> That's a perfect lead into what we want to talk about today, um, which is uh, why kidneys fail, right? Why are your kidneys, and you mentioned these two diseases, why are kidneys so vulnerable to high blood pressure and diabetes? So I have some screen sharing myself. <laughs> Just so you know, uh -huh. <laughs> um, let's see. I, I want to show you an article and then I have a PowerPoint to show you. So let's start with the I do article. Love, so love the Saturday shows. Okay, so uh, here we go. I wanted to just answer the question, why is this even such a, 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 a relevant topic? Why are so many people uh, concerned with kidney disease, dealing with kidney disease? <clears throat> so the National Kidney Foundation, and these statistics can be found in other places as well, but I like the way they summarize. They, uh, so I went to kidney.org easy to remember. And they have a sheet called the fast facts. And just look at a couple of these facts. Kidney disease affects one in seven, more than one in seven adults. That's 15% of the adult population. Appro approximately, I did not know this, approximately 90%, that's nine zero, of those with kidney disease don't know they have it. And two of five adults with severe disease don't, severe kidney disease don't know that they have it. One in three adults in the US is at risk for kidney disease. And um, this, this is amazing, kidney disease, it is a leading cause of death in the US, but uh, it gives you a different spin on the statistics a little bit later. So what is kidney disease? I'm gonna talk about that in the PowerPoint. What causes it? The two main conditions were the primary diagnosis of diabetes or high blood pressure. Other conditions can lead to it, but these two, 76% uh, of kidney failure is attributable to diabetes, high blood pressure, or both. Many people do have both. Um, how is it treated? Well, the first word, yes, early detection is, early detection is great, but uh, kidney dialysis and a kidney transplant, that's how the medical industry thinks about it. And there are a lot of statistics on dialysis, et cetera. Racial disparities, oh my goodness. Children, adolescents, it's incredible with um, the information that is available about kidney disease. So uh, I wanna give you a little background because there's a reason the kidneys are so vulnerable to those to uh, diseases. So to the PowerPoint. Let me get this started from Okay, great. So where are your kidneys located? <laughs> We're going to have sound effects one day. <laughs> I'm sure of it. Sure. So kidneys are located um, just under your rib cage, but they're in the back. And they're called, they're in a position called retroperitoneal. They're behind the abdomen. And that was a problem before we had CAT scans and MRIs because a lot of things were happening in the kidneys, let's say infections, 
um, in the kidney tissue, bleeding, whatnot, that um, we would do what we call an exploratory laparotomy. We'd cut people open from the front and look around and take fluid samples and whatnot, but nothing would show because the kidneys were retroperitoneal. So they're in the back, just barely protected by the ribs. And that's why kidney punches are so bad in boxing uh, because the kin kidneys are vulnerable there. All right. So blood flow into and out of the kidney. I just wanna show you that the oxygenated blood, which we represent as red, and okay, don't talk about my slides, all right? These were, I called a friend of mine, I was like, that I used to teach with. I said, I think my super teacher powers have waned. And they have a little bit, but I'm, I'm, I'm reclaiming my super teacher powers, but uh, I just grabbed some thumbnails and blew them up and it's okay, don't worry. You, I'll, I'll, you don't worry about the words. I'll make this clear. So the point of this slide is bl oxygenated blood goes into the kidney and deoxygenated blood comes out of the kidney, goes back to the heart. Cool. But something else comes out of the kidney. So uh, again, oxygenated blood goes into the kidney. The magic happens. And not only does deoxygenated blood come out, but urine also comes out. So something happens to make this urine. Um, and we're going to talk about that. So interestingly enough, the kidney is not a, what you would call a fleshy um, organ. It is a, it's a collection of millions and millions and millions of little tubes. And all these tubes just kind of cluster together and do their thing. So we're gonna look at one lobule. So let's look back at this last picture. So can, we can see one lobule here of the kidney and it, it has several lobules, right? So let's look a little closer at one lobule and we will see the structural and functional unit of the kidney, which is called the nephron. And the nephron is where all the action happens, but basically it's a bunch of tubes and blood vessels. So this one, it's, it, it's hard to see kind of, but uh, what I want you to really see is that there's oxygenated blood going into these little balls and oxygenated blood coming out of these little balls. But then down here in the renal tissue, we have oxygenated blood going into a capillary bed and coming out deoxygenated. And then this, this blood will leave the kidneys. Okay, so I use the word capillaries and I just wanna give you a picture of what capillaries look like because here's the important thing. The lining of the capillary, which we call the endothelium is only one cell thick. So there's no backup basically for them. If anything happens to these cells and they're just pushed so intimately to each other in uh, these junctions, if anything happens to damage the cells, uh, that's gonna affect the blood flow. Now, the lumen, so the, the width of the capillary is only big enough to allow one red blood cell at a time to pass through. And actually, this is, a, this is a nice illustration of red blood cells going through, but it's actually even a little smaller than this, the, the lumen, because the red blood cells, the average diameter is, well, yeah, average width is eight microns. And the average width of the smallest capillaries is four microns. So they're actually going through a tube that's half their diameter. So the blood, it's really important that these red blood cells can 
maneuver, they can fold, they can uh, squeeze through these capillaries and get their business done, which is oxygen exchange, nutrient exchange, waste exchange. So here again is an illustration of uh, red blood cells flowing through a capillary, but remember in real life, this capillary would be about half the size. Okay. Now those are regular capillaries, but this, the kidney has a special capillary called a glomerulus. And that is this little ball here. Remember the little balls in the last picture? The little balls are called uh, Bowman's capsules, but the red part, the capillary bed is called a glomerulus. So this is what happens. The urine, the blood comes into the glomerulus. It filters out liquid and it keeps in hopefully blood cells, platelets, plasma, uh, not plasma, the plasma goes out, uh, proteins, you know, albumin, we look for things, but that plasma then goes in to this Bowman's capsule and goes through the tube and magic happens and it becomes urine. It eventually goes out the ureter. So what's happening here? Filtration. The blood comes in, goes through the capillaries. Remember, tiny, 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 tiny capillaries. And then it comes out and goes on to do more stuff in the kidneys. This is a very unique arrangement in the body. And this is why the, the kidneys are at such risk. And that is because these capillaries are under pressure. They have to have more pressure to push the liquid out into the capsule that's going to eventually become urine. So the pressure here inside these little capillaries is about double the pressure of the capillaries in the rest of the body and even in the rest of the kidney. So here's a picture of what happens, uh, you know, a schematic. So the, the, the arterial blood comes in to the glomerular capillary, like I said, double the pressure. It comes out and then it goes down and it attaches or it, it services these tubules. Then there's, uh, re here's the real capillary exchange of, well, I'll explain what happens there later, but then that deoxygenated blood will leave the kidneys. But something is so different here with these capillaries than with these capillaries. And that is that the pressure is so intense here and the pressure is low here. So you put it all together. Uh, this is again, just a schematic of what's happening in the glomerulus. The glomerular capillaries, look over here, same thing. Glomerular capillaries here versus the regular, I'm saying regular, the renal capillaries. These capillaries act like all the other capillaries. Oxygenated blood comes in, deoxygenated blood goes out. But these capillaries, oxygenated blood comes in, oxygenated blood goes out, it's all under pressure. And that's so the fluid can be pushed out of the bloodstream into the Bowman's capsule without the bloodstream losing red blood cells and the larger particles. So use your imagination just a little bit. Imagine the damage if there's too much pressure inside the glomerulus, mm. boom, it could rupture. Then mm. what'll happen? Now you've got red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, proteins, everything that's in the blood now can show up and will show up in the urine. Mm. 
Mm. What if there's not enough fluid in the circulation? Mm. Well, remember these capillaries. Now, this is smaller under normal circumstances. If there's not enough fluid, it's going to be smaller still. And mm. you could have some backup in the mm. flow. Mm. And even to the extent that the capillaries can become blocked. What if it, there's a clot, right? And uh, the clot blocks the capillary. Uh, what if there are trees on the surface of the capillary that are made, uh, that are glycoprotein trees that um, ha they have a lot of sugar on the surface of the red blood cells. Then as they're trying to navigate through this capillary, it can grab, it can cause damage to that real thin one cell layer endothelial wall. What if inside the red blood cells, the hemoglobin, you might've heard of hemoglobin A1C or glycosylated hemoglobin, that means that sugar, so when there's excess sugar in the bloodstream, that sugar goes into the red blood cell, attaches to the hemoglobin and becomes glycohemoglobin. Well, this hemoglobin can't move and fold and, and react and respond to the capillary. And so they don't flow so well inside those narrow capillaries. What if the red blood cells are sticky? from a lot of oxidative products in the blood, from a lot of inflammatory products in the blood, and they form something called rouleau formations. Uh, this is different uh, as far as trying to get through, even though these red blood cells, uh, the hemoglobin may not be glycosylated, they, they're sticky and they're sticking to each other. And so they don't, uh, get through the tiny, tiny openings of the glomerular capillaries. And they, again, can have uh, blockage. So there are three functions that the kidney does and it is magical. <laughs> I can't even, I mean, actually it does more. They do a lot more, but the main three functions are filtration, that happens right here at the glomerulus where plasma is filtered through the, the glomerular capillaries. And reabsorption, so anything that's small enough to get filtered goes through. Good stuff, bad stuff, nutrients, whatever's in the bloodstream, right? So the, the tubules have the capacity to put stuff back. It, they recognize or, the, or to keep stuff out. They recognize, well, there's even, there's a lot of good stuff there. So we're going to um, pump it back into, into the interstitial tissues and eventually these capillaries will pick it back up. And then secretion. Sometimes there's, there's things that don't completely get pumped out here, for instance, drugs, toxins. And so there's second, there are different parts of the tubules that recognize that. And they're like, oh, that doesn't belong. We got to pump that back out so it can be uh, taken out of the body. It's amazing. Okay. But look, if this little area here is damaged, then how is the rest of it going to function? So what's our answer? When I say our, I'm talking about the medical industrial complex. Mm. We see that this isn't functioning, right? There's no uh, reabsorption secretion going on. Ta-da, we can build a machine. So instead of what's naturally happening in the body, we've got dialysis. And this is a dialysis filter. This is a dialyzer. And this is what filters the, I, I don't, I cannot imagine what it feels like to be on one of these machines. I can't imagine it. And, you know, 
kudos to the brains of the big brains of people who thought this up, but what if we could fix just that one little part that's having a problem? Because the rest of this might work, right? If we could just fix this part. So how could we possibly do that? Well, what if we could decrease inflammation? That might help the, the flow through here, right? What if we could decrease the damage that sugar call causes mm -hmm. both on the surface of the red blood cells and inside uh, attached to the hemoglobin? What if we could detoxify the body, decrease the oxidative stress? Do you think there might be some benefit to these little capillaries? What if we could increase the blood flow? What if you know, we had a little more good hydration. Uh, would that let things flow better? What if we could decrease the stickiness of the red blood cells? Maybe that would make the flow better through this little piece. And then the rest of this would just function the way it's supposed to. Maybe, right? So, just, um, a, a, I guess, an overview of why these um, two diseases are ravaging the kidneys so, so much. And maybe some things we could do about it. Three-pronged approach, anybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Mr. Hope, what say you, sir?